The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. That's in Hebrews 4.12. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 Before we start our Bible study today, as it is our custom, let us prepare ourselves for the study of the Word of God by being filled by God the Holy Spirit through the rebound technique of First John 1 John 1.9 which says if we confess our known sins He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our known sins and to cleanse us from all unknown or forgotten sins and righteousness. So you will then be in fellowship with God, filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, ready to learn Bible doctrine from the Word of God. If you have never personally believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the issue is not naming your sins. The issue is faith alone in Christ alone. Therefore, let us pray. We consider it a privilege, Heavenly Father, to have the freedom and the opportunity of fellowshipping with you and your word. We thank you for bringing us this time in this assembly today to take in your truths which we badly need in our spiritual life. We now pray that God the Holy Spirit will enlighten, guide, and motivate and challenge us to what we're going to study today. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Welcome everyone, our subscribers, followers, fellow believers. And uh, on, we are still concentrating on the topic, living by faith. Okay, we will continue. I guess we can finish this by tomorrow. All right, where we stopped yesterday, that's where we will continue in our discussion. We have said already that there are two kinds of suffering for the believer. Categorical one, suffering, and categorical two, suffering. Now we know that categorical one, suffering, is suffering in the will of God. That's in 1 Peter 3.17 and 1 Peter 4. 19. And then the categorical two suffering, which is the suffering of divine discipline, that's any and all suffering that accrues to the believer out of fellowship, out there in carnality. And so he is under either in initial discipline or intensive discipline. And if he is under intensive discipline, he may be heading for maximum discipline, namely the sin unto death. But that's uh, disciplinary suffering for personal sin in the believer's life. Category 1 suffering is suffering in which there is no personal sin in the believer's life. If compassion suffering testing suffering, the suffering because of the evil of others. And therefore, since the believer in fellowship is producing divine good, the production of divine good means the believer is delivered from any and all divine discipline because he is not out of fellowship. 
Okay? In other words, the believer in fellowship automatically produces divine good. He is therefore automatically not under any form of divine discipline and can't be. And that's why activated faith in the faith rest life produces divine good. And that production of divine good delivers the believer from divine discipline. Now, look at the end of verse 14. It says, can faith save him? Now, remember, this is not soteriological faith. This is phase two faith. Is faith able to deliver him from divine discipline? Now, what kind of faith is he talking about? Would you go back to the middle of the verse? This verse says, If a believer may say, that is, if he may contend that he has activated faith, the faith functioning with the faithless life. In other words, this believer says, I'm walking in fellowship with God. I'm right here, right on that bottom circle. He says this, but the characteristics of his life is, he does not have the production of divine good. That is, he does not have, it simply says, he does not have works. What it means is, he does not have good works. He does not have the production of divine good. Now, you have to think with us here. He says, this believer says, I'm walking in fellowship with God, but he is not producing divine good. Now he says one thing, but he is not producing divine good. What kind of faith does the believer have who does not produce divine good? The answer is dead faith, non-activated faith, non-appropriating faith. And therefore he may say he is in fellowship, but he does not produce divine good. Then in reality he is out of fellowship and in carnality, walking in darkness, and therefore he is productive, but he is productive of human good or dead works. So, every believer produces every moment of his day, right? Every day he is either producing divine good or he is producing human good. If he is producing divine good, then he is in fellowship. If he is producing human good, then he is out of fellowship. I thought, and I hope this is very clear to you. And the productivity is automatic based upon what the believer is. If he is a spiritual believer, he produces divine good. But if he is a carnal believer, then he produces human good. When he is in fellowship, he may be driving down the freeway. Yes, when you are in fellowship, you may be doing something, and that something you're doing is going to produce divine good. Understand that? So let me repeat. <clears throat> if you are in fellowship, what you are doing is divine good. While if you are out of fellowship, what you're doing is human good. Now, <clears throat> Switching back to the doctrine of salvation, God is presenting a stimulus of the gospel message to unbelievers. Unbelievers are warned of the horrible consequence of rejection of Christ, the lake of fire, the eternal fire. Now, there are kinds of things that cause tremendous maximum pain to the members of the human race. One is physical pain caused by fire, by burning. That is intense. The other one is emotional pain caused by loneliness. You know, the greatest emotional pain that people suffer in life is loneliness. Do you think God does not know how to judge unbelievers? What's the lake of fire is going to be? They are in the blackness of darkness forever. Total isolation of loneliness, 
burning in fire. What a combination. As Second Peter chapter 2 says, you know, God knows how to punish the ungodly. And there's a whole big conditional clause there in Second Peter chapter 2. And it also says, God also knows how to deliver the believer out of temptations. Don't underestimate God. <coughs> Either in His capacity to punish or in His capacity to impute grace and blessing. Don't toy around with the Word of God on your life as a believer. You go with the Word. You watch what God does for your life. Your life would become so fabulous, it would become so wonderful that you would look around on people who are indifferent and lethargic toward the Word, and you want to kick them on the butt, and you would tell them, Wake up, you jerk. The Word is wonderful. Get your butt to class and start learning. Grow up. Put your butt or put your butt down on a chair so your brain can absorb something valuable. Now let us review. The believer who is in fellowship with God automatically produces what kind of good? Divine good. And he is not under divine discipline. Okay? Now here is a believer who says he is in fellowship. But actually he is not. Now what kind of faith that, does that believer out of fellowship have? The answer is a dead faith. A non-appropriating faith. A deactivated faith. Now the question at the end of verse 14 can that dead faith deliver the believer from divine discipline? No, it can't. And not only that, the question here is introduced by the negative me. <clears throat> and me demands a negative response. No, it cannot. But just to show you that the believer in fellowship here is not under divine discipline. This time, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 8 verse 1. And this is where we will start tomorrow. Let us pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we're going to close our Bible study today, directed toward those who are without Christ, without hope, without eternal life. This is a moment, a moment in your life, no matter what you think, no matter what you believe, it's a moment of consideration. It's a moment to put everything else out of your mind and think about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does all this mean? What is Christianity? Well, Christianity is Christ. It's a relationship with God through Christ. And there's only one way to have that relationship, as the Scripture says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thus shalt be saved. Works, all the works you can do, have nothing to do with your relationship with God. Why? Because you are a sinner. Because you are not perfect as God is perfect. Because His righteousness has to reject unrighteousness and you are unrighteous no matter how many good deeds you do that is where Christ comes in that's how important he is because he is the only one who can present you faultless before God how does he do that well he went to the cross he went to the cross for one reason to die and to die for you to die for every member of the human race. He didn't care whether people rejected him or not. He died for them. That is God's grace. His absolute grace. And what does that mean for him to die for us? It means that while he was hanging on the cross, 
God the Father imputed all the sins of all mankind to Jesus Christ. He took all of your sins upon himself. And when he did that, he paid the penalty. So right where you sit right now, you can make that decision for or against Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your wonderful word to us so that we might understand ourselves, so that we might understand the world around us from the divine perspective. Thank you once again for this Bible study through the YouTube. We pray that what we learned in your word today may become a blessing to our life. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.